Hey guys, it's Alex here. Now, if you're thinking about starting up your very first saltwater aquarium, there are a number of things that can seem quite daunting and put you off. But with many of those things, the reality is very different from the theory. So today, I'm gonna to tell you five common saltwater fears that you shouldn't worry about. Before we get into the video, if it's your first time here, I put out a video every week with tips on how to set up and maintain an awesome reef tank. So make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss out on anything. Right, let's get stuck in. First up is the enigma that is the sump. How does it work? How do you control the water level? Will it flood your house? Well, the reality is they're really simple. And ultimately a sump is just a glass box to keep your filtration equipment in. You use a water pump known as a return pump to send water from the sump up a pipe and to the display tank. Then there's a second pipe in the display tank for water to run back down to the sump and usually a third emergency downpipe in case the main drain gets clogged, which by the way never happens. If you turn the return pump off, the water level in the display tank drops to the top of your downpipe, or if you have one, to the level of the box that hides the pipes, which is called a weir box. The water from your tank drops into your sump, and consequently the water level in your sump rises slightly, but there's never too much water in your sump or your tank to spill out onto your carpet, so you really don't have to worry about floods. Most sumps have different sections separated by glass panels or baffles, which help you separate out your filtration equipment. The final section in any sump is where your return pump goes, and that is the section that controls the water level. A water level sensor sits in with the return pump, and as water evaporates from the tank, the water level in the return pump section drops. When it does so, your water level sensor will add water from a separate freshwater reservoir back into your sump to bring the level back to where it should be. And all you need to do is fill up your freshwater reservoir once a week. And if you're wondering, you replace evaporated water with fresh water, not salt water, because the salt stays behind when evaporation takes place. The next fear you shouldn't worry about is how complex the hobby sounds. If you watch enough videos on keeping a reef tank, you would be forgiven for thinking you need a degree in marine biology to even get started. And us saltwater folk love nothing more than telling you how clever we are for having mastered such a complicated hobby. You'll hear about testing and maintaining major elements, minor elements, trace elements, nitrate, phosphate, ionic balance, amino acids, pH, the list goes on. But that's really all just noise, and 95% of running a successful reef tank is just about getting the basics right. You only need to concern yourself with the final 5% when you have a tank packed full of the most difficult to keep corals and want to extract every last drop of additional growth or colour from your tank. To start keeping beginner friendly soft corals, once you've added rock, salt water and a heater to your tank, all you need is a filter, usually a protein skimmer to remove pollutants from your tank, lighting to allow your corals to photosynthesize, and power heads to create flow and keep your corals healthy. Those really are the only areas you need to worry about when you're starting out. And in terms of testing, you only really need to test nitrate and phosphate regularly, which are the main parameters you need to keep in check to keep your soft corals happy and to keep algae at bay. It is worth checking your salinity level from time to time, but that tends to stay steady by itself. And testing is just a matter of dipping a salinity pen in your tank and getting a digital readout. The hobby only has to be as complicated as you want it to be. So if you want a simple life, there are dozens of beautiful low maintenance soft corals to choose from. And even if you want to progress onto intermediate corals like LPS, a regular water change schedule should be enough to keep your tank looking healthy, at least in the short to medium term. Next up is research. It is really easy to think you need to spend a year or more researching the hobby and getting your head around everything before you buy your first marine tank, or even that you need to master running a freshwater tank before coming over to the salty side. And while I'd always encourage you to read up so you know what you're getting yourself into, the best way to learn anything new is to get your hands dirty. Think of it as when you started driving. You talked to your dad for hours about clutch control, but I bet you a pound to a penny you stalled the first five times you tried to pull away. Ultimately, if you're the kind of person who's prepared to spend time reading up on the minutiae of the hobby, you are likely to have the makings of a conscientious marine aquarist. And that, combined with patience, is far more valuable than spending months or even years with your head in books before you get started. Now, to be fair, obsessing about starting a new hobby is part of the fun. But if you think the foreplay is good, just wait till you get stuck in. 
The penultimate fear you shouldn't worry about is a really simple one, making your own salt water. Given everything else you need to think of when you're starting out, it's so easy to just ask your local fish shop to supply ready-mixed salt water, but there are real benefits of making salt water yourself, and it's a lot easier than you might think. You should think of the hobby as keeping water, not keeping fish and corals, and the water you use to start your tank is the foundation on which your reef is built. Shop-bought water is often not the best quality, now that's not a criticism of shops, it's just that filtering water on a large scale means the filters wear out very quickly, which in turn means the water produced may have things like nitrate and phosphate in it that can cause you to have algae problems. It's also quite expensive to buy ready-mixed salt water, and you can save a significant amount of money in the long run by mixing your own. All you need is a good quality water filter, known as an RODI filter, and a bucket of salt mix. RODI filters can seem daunting, but they're just a series of containers with different filter media in them that strip out all of the impurities in your tap water. Just get yourself a dedicated saltwater aquarium RODI filter, anything with at least four stages will be fine, and the more the better. All salt mixes come with instructions on how to prepare them, but quite simply all you need is a bucket and a water pump to do the stirring for you. Measure out the water you need, then add the correct amount of salt. You need to check the salinity level at the end to make sure it's right, but digital salinity meters like this one from Hannah make that an absolute cinch. If the salinity is too high, add more RODI water, and if it's too low, add more salt powder. And once you've done this a couple of times, you'll get to know the exact amount of salt you need to add to your standard water mix-up to make the right salinity level. The RODI filter will pay for itself in terms of cost and convenience in no time. And having control over the quality of water you use is one of the best ways to get your tank off on the right foot. And the number one saltwater aquarium fear you shouldn't worry about is dealing with algae. The thought of spending hundreds or even thousands of pounds on your dream tank only to end up with more vegetation than a rainforest is really rather depressing. And to be honest with you, algae is inevitable in a reef tank. It is of course present in the wild, and conditions that suit growing corals also tend to suit growing algae rather well. But there is so much information and knowledge online about how to get rid of nuisance algae that it doesn't have to be a problem. There's even this excellent 5 minute guide from the most handsome YouTuber in reefing. The main things algae needs to grow is light and nutrients, and it's common for new hobbyists to set their lights too bright too soon and to overfeed fish, resulting in excess nutrients. So if you start slow and get that balance right, you're less likely to have problems. But even if you don't get that balance right, there are numerous easy ways of reducing nutrients, usually by simply increasing your filtration capacity or reducing the amount you feed your fish. And even if you can't fix that, a good crew of algae eaters can easily keep on top of it for you. In particular, urchins and fish like tangs and rabbitfish will make light work of any algae that pops up. On my tank I have high nutrients and very strong lighting, and yet I have no real algae in no small part because of my vegetable loving cleanup crew. Anytime I add a coral frag or piece of rock with algae on it to my tank, they carefully peck the algae off in 5 seconds flat. So with the right mix of algae eaters from the start, you might never see algae in your tank at all. Now of course this video is aimed at you if you're starting out in the hobby, and it can become as complicated as you like. But that is very much a good thing, as that's when it gets really interesting, and it's what hooks you. There will always be something new to discover, the hobby will always keep you interested, and it will always keep you challenged. If you enjoyed the video then, give me a thumbs up and subscribe for next week, and until next time, happy reefing.